Faith in the Fog is based on an excellent sermon series presented by Pastor Lance Lowell of Neighborhood Church in Modesto, California. Pastor Lowell gave me his sermon notes and encouraged me to design a video series. The episodes that you will see are a collaboration between Pastor Lowell and myself. I hope you enjoy this production. We all have seen the documentaries on the Serengeti Plains of Africa, and we marvel at the majestic herds of water buffalo, elephants, giraffes, impalas, and gazelle grazing across the plains. But on the Serengeti, we also see the harsh reality of lions cheetahs and hyenas feasting on the weak and isolated. For the social animals of the Serengeti, isolation is a death sentence. Just like the herd animals of the Serengeti, we are social animals who need social contact. Even though this may be a hard pill to swallow, we need each other. Psychology defines social isolation as the state of complete or near complete lack of contact between individuals and social groups. Social isolation has certain characteristics common in all forms of isolation. All types of social isolation can include staying home for long periods of time, having no communication with family, friends, or social groups, and willfully avoiding any contact with their social group when opportunities arise. Social isolation can be detrimental to our emotional and physical health. It can lead to feelings of loneliness fear of others, or negative self-esteem. Lack of consistent human contact can also cause conflicts and problems with our family or within our social group. In the hypothesis proposed by Professor John Cossipio, social isolation can decrease the lifespan of the person isolating him or herself dramatically. Since we are social animals, our local congregations become social herds we should be involved with. But do all Christians understand their need for social interaction? Is it possible that our social isolation can become a dark and dense spiritual fog that separates us from the herd of the body of Christ? The answer to these two questions is a clear and concise yes. The fog of isolation can be very destructive to our health and spiritual well-being. When we isolate ourselves from the herd, we become prime targets for the demonic lions of the kingdom of darkness. Our very spiritual survival is connected to being joined to the body of Christ. King Solomon, in the book of Proverbs, made the following observation. He who separates himself 
seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. King Solomon formed the conclusion that people who isolate themselves have rejected all good and sound wisdom and seek only their personal desires and wants. In some regards, the Christian isolationist is motivated by self-pity and self-interest. Solomon also understood that isolationists are resistive to all sound wisdom. They quarrel with family and church who only seek to help, and they become the source of conflict and problems within their social network. We think that those who seek isolation only want to hide. But this is not the case. Isolation is not hiding. It is living separated and alone. The reality is that we can live an isolated existence while carrying out the normal functions of life. What are the most common causes of isolation? Are there warning signs we should look for? By nature, people do not like conflict. We desire a life without stress and mistrust. But this is not possible. Philip Slater, the sociologist, wrote that conflict will never be eliminated from human affairs. Conflict is simply the active expression of differences and an essential part of human development. Without conflict, change would be impossible. Conflict is a part of the human experience that cannot be avoided, but we try to hide from it. When conflict arises, we resist the change that it fosters by isolating ourselves. We don't like change because change can be painful. It is easier to divorce than to change. One of the warning signs of isolationism is the tendency to run from conflict. The Bible makes clear that the most primal struggle we experience is the conflict between our natural sinful desires and the Holy Spirit. Let's read. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Consider this thought. Is it possible that we isolate ourselves from our family and church out of guilt caused by the conflict we have in our human soul. Should our answer be yes, then we fail to understand one very important spiritual principle. The conflict is in us all. To isolate ourselves out of guilt is a big mistake because we only frustrate the working of the Holy Spirit to help us overcome the guilt. To run from conflict is only going to prolong the conflict. Isolation is not the answer to the problems we face.
There are times when the struggle is long and hard and we isolate ourselves. So we disengage from the struggle out of exhaustion. We all enjoy our social groups during seasons of comfort and convenience. But should challenge and controversy arise, we lose heart and break fellowship. On to the next church we go, seeking to be free from the struggle. Again, how true are the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. We lose heart when our faith is shaken and our trust is challenged. Our emotional exhaustion becomes the right spiritual condition for a fog of isolation to form. Eventually, our struggles become too much. Therefore, we flee into the quagmire of isolation, and eventually, the quicksand of despair drags us down. The Apostle Paul encourages his readers in the book of Galatians to not become weary in doing the right thing. Let's read. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Isolation only frustrates the work of the Holy Spirit to produce a spiritual harvest in our lives. At first glance, this issue doesn't seem to have a connection with isolationism. But we get distracted by comparisons. How does comparing one thing with another cause us to withdraw into isolationism? When we go to stores, we are encouraged to compare items to find the best buy. But comparing things is not the same as comparing people. People have heart and soul. They have blood and bone. People experience pain and struggle without exception. All people endure the difficulties of life. We are not the same. We are unique and loved by God. Even though we might understand this simple truth, we are not tolerant of the differences found in other people. We church people sit in our pews, comparing our Christian experience with the faith of other people. We see comparison being made out of failure. We look down the road to see the people caught in the joy and happiness of worship, arms up, head back, singing the praises of God. We think these people have no cares in the world. We look at these people and compare their worship with ours and think, what is wrong with me? Why do I feel this way? Should we not be careful with this line of thinking, we allow the fog of isolation to form around us. We see our failure and don't understand why others walk in apparent joy and happiness. So, we withdraw from the church and isolate ourselves. Our personal comparison distorts the truth that the supposed happy people also have pain and heartache, but they have chosen to find their rest in Jesus. 
It says in the Gospel of John, Stop judging by mere appearance and make a righteous judgment. Then we have the comparison made out of fear. We come to church and look down the row and think that these people are a bunch of hypocrites. Then the preacher begins his or her message, and we know we are among hypocrites. We leave the church determined not to return, because that congregation doesn't act like true Christians, even though we don't know what a true Christian looks like. Back into isolation we go, feeling sanctimonious that we could spot those hypocrites. We are warned by the Apostle Paul that our surface opinion may not be based on fact. You are looking only on the surface of things. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as he. we may not realize that our comparison is made from fear. Fear of what the Christian life could bring to us. Should we leave churches because it's filled with hypocrites, then these churches are minus one less hypocrite with our leaving. Let's return to the Serengeti Plains of Africa again. We see the majestic herds migrating across the plains. Then they spook and run for safety. Why would the herds run? They run for survival because the predatory lions, cheetahs, and hyenas came too close to the herd. The need to flee for safety is a basic survival mechanism built into all living creatures. The survival instinct is very basic in our human DNA. We build barriers and walls out of a need for safety. Throughout history, cities have built walls and forts to provide safety in hazardous situations. We also see this basic survival mechanism in our relationships, especially our church relationships. Church is a place we should feel safe, but that is not always the case. We get hurt. We have our expectations crushed, and people who we thought were safe are not safe. People who we thought loved us rise up against us and our pain and confusion is a direct result of our disillusionment. This is what happens during church splits. People who were our friends become the agents of gossip against us. Out of need for safety, we isolate ourselves from the conflict. There is one glaring problem with isolation. It can harden our hearts to any future church relationships. Keep in mind that isolationism is a hard thing to stop or keep at bay once it starts. God does not want us to separate from each other or live in isolation. He sent Jesus to restore our relationship with him and with each other. Is isolation a behavior that Jesus would support? I think not. If we feel the need to isolate ourselves, then it's important we understand that this action is contrary to the teachings of Jesus and we are acting on our own. John chapter 17 records 
the most important prayer Jesus uttered in the Gospels. Consider the situation. Jesus is preparing himself to return to his Father through the path of Calvary. Many people mistakenly think that Jesus prayed this prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane away from his disciples. But this is not the case. John chapter 18 established the location of this prayer in the upper room, in the presence of his disciples. The upper room was maybe that last teachable moment Jesus would have with his disciples. Therefore, Jesus uttered this prayer in their presence. The undercurrent of John chapter 17 is the importance of brotherhood and the unity of the coming church. We are using this prayer as the path we need to follow to step out of the fog of isolation. Let's return to Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1. He who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. One of the consequences of isolation is the rejection of sound wisdom. When we start to isolate ourselves, we begin to argue against all forms of help and wisdom. We say things like, I don't need your help, I'm just fine. Or, I'm in a pretty good place right now, I don't need anyone to help me. Thoughts like these completely underestimate what others have done to help and it totally overestimates our abilities to help ourselves. We can't do it on our own. There is safety in numbers. Every good shepherd understands this truth. The flock must stay together to remain healthy. Isaiah the prophet taught that we all are like sheep who have gone astray. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The natural inclination of sheep is to go astray, to wander off on its own accord. Just like the Serengeti plains of Africa, the solitary sheep could end up dead. The duty of the shepherd is to keep his flock together for their own protection. This is the reason why Jesus taught the parable of the lost sheep. It is the one sheep that is separated that is in the greatest danger. No wonder, Jesus' first item of prayer was to protect the flock and keep them united in relationship. Let's read from John chapter 17. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. In this prayer, Jesus made known his will. May my disciples be one as we are one. Unity is the heart of the Christian faith. Jesus prayed that his followers would come to complete unity to let the world know that Jesus was sent by God the Father. When we understand this truth, we will realize how dangerous isolationism is 
to our personal faith. Should we want to know the will of God, then we must remain involved in the body of Christ. Now, we come to the reason why isolationism is a favorite attack tool used by the enemies of Christ to cause us to stumble. Isn't it interesting how the enemy comes knocking on our door with the temptation to remove ourselves from the saints? But when we are isolated, there is never temptation to leave the relationships that keep us isolated from the people of God. Once we are isolated, we often find ourselves doing something we never thought we would do. And then, it's amazing how fast the enemy comes to tell us that we can never go back because we will not be accepted after what we have done. When we follow Christ, we find that He leads us gently back into the flock and into relationship and unity with fellow believers and out of isolation, because this is the prayer He prayed. Should our desire be that we grow in Christ, then we must remain grafted into the body of Christ. Jesus also prayed in John chapter 17. My prayer is not for them alone. I also pray for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me, I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. We want the will of God? Then we must be attached to a local congregation, warts and all, because this local expression of the body of Christ is the garden we need to grow spiritually. Spiritual growth is not always a joyous experience. It can be painful and challenging, but the pain of relationship is our fertile soil of growth. Setting at home, being isolated from the body of Christ, channel surfing TV evangelists does not provide us the same growth medium. In the epistle to the Ephesians, we find the Apostle Paul preaching a similar message to the church in Ephesus. What is the theme? Unity in the body of Christ through relationships. Let's read. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and be mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then. We will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speak the truth in love. We will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Paul envisioned the church 
as a living organism that continually grows until it reaches maturity. He also saw that each individual member was part of the growing process, encouraging each other, ministering to each other, and growing in unity. There is a growing movement among spiritual elites that being part of a local congregation is not necessary. Often these elitists attend several different churches and find flaws in most of them. They are quick to point out the hypocrisy and injustices of others, meanwhile ignoring the basic truth of God's Word in their own life about being part of the body. This attitude is brought on by spiritual pride and ignorance of Scripture and sound wisdom. What is this sound wisdom? In order to mature, we have to put ourselves in places where we interact with others. Maturity comes with responsibility. Responsibility for ourselves, responsibility for our brothers and sisters in Christ, and responsibility for those who have not heard the gospel. It isn't long before these spiritual elites are troubled with the fact that they are not growing in Christ. Why am I not growing, they think. The answer is simple. They are not grafted into the local congregation, the growing medium. The responsibility to take the message of Christ to the world greatly expands the issue of isolation. Our mission to the world is much bigger than our fears and confusion. Let's read. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The things that lead us to isolation are usually the things that put us at odds with others. The last thing we want to do in our isolation is to carry the weight of our guilt, the guilt caused by the effect we have on others when we shun them. Eternity is the truth we all must consider. Not just our eternity, but the eternity of the lost in the world. When we isolate ourselves, we cause rupture in the unity of the body of Christ. We might think we are not that important to the overall health of the body, but we are. The body of Christ functions because we all provide ministry to the whole. The body grows and builds itself up in love because each part does its work. The baseline for unity in the body of Christ is an individual commitment to Jesus and His Lordship. The Lord is concerned when we suffer abuse by the words and actions of other Christian brothers and sisters. But unity requires risk. We must be open to work through the hard stuff that causes pain to find a path of resolution. If we are submitted to Christ, then we must be open to resolution and unity even if there has been a violation or disagreement. The last impression Jesus made on his disciples was a call to unity and that their lives 
would be extensions of his. The Bible records disagreements that could have ruptured unity. The contention between Peter and Paul and the sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas, but in both cases we see efforts made for resolution and unity in the body of Christ. Let's consider the great seal of the United States of America with the great motto, E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. A house divided against itself cannot stand. So are the words of Jesus. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. The principle stands sound. Unity is essential for spiritual health and success. Without unity, any social group will crumble into ruin. The health of a marriage, a family, a local congregation, and a nation is connected to the unity of the group. When the unity of any social institution is shattered by conflict or controversy, then the unity begins to decay and the stench of death fills the air. We are living in a season of challenge and controversy. Our country seems to be divided along ideological and political lines. Again, how true are the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Unity is the key to spiritual health and growth. But isolation is the enemy of unity. Isolation exalts the individual, while unity builds a strong corporate identity. Let us never forget that out of many, we must become one. We must individually accept responsibility for the unity of the whole. Let e pluribus unum be our personal motto. For the last several episodes, we have pondered the various conditions that can form a spiritual fog. We explored the shortcomings of being caught in the feeling God trap. We also considered the feelings of being overwhelmed, confused, and being isolated as dangerous conditions that can allow a chilling spiritual fog to form around us. Those who live in the Central Valley of California understand the fog season. We can go days or weeks without seeing the sun because the fog settles in and distorts the world we see. We can see so much gray nothingness that we develop a type of claustrophobia caused by the fog. All we want to see is the sun, so we drive through the fog to the foothills in order to bask in the warm rays of the sun. When we are in a spiritual fog, we must realize that the sun is our only hope for peace of mind and healing. In order to come out of the fog, we must step into the sunshine and allow the warming rays of the sun to burn away the fog. But for you who revere my name, 
the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Malachi the prophet taught that those who honor and revere the name of God will see the Son of Righteousness arise with healing because the warming rays of God will burn away the fog. How do we come out of our spiritual fog? We must find our faith in the fog. We must restore our relationship with the true Son of Righteousness, our Lord Jesus Christ.